reading in the book of the Acts. Story of the church. And we've arrived at chapter 6. So Lisa is going to read to us from Acts 6 and verse 8 down to verse 13. Stephen was richly blessed by God, who gave him the power to do great miracles and signs among the people. But some Jewish people were against him. They belonged to the synagogue of three men, as it was called, which included Jewish people from Cyrene, Alexandria, Seleucia, and Asia. They all came and argued with Stephen. But the Spirit was helping him to speak with wisdom, and his words were so strong that they could not argue with him. So they secretly urged some men to say, We heard Stephen speak against Moses and against God. This upset the people the Jewish elders and the teachers of the law. They came and grabbed Stephen and brought him to a meeting of the Jewish leaders. They brought in some people to tell lies about Stephen, saying, This man is always speaking against this holy place. Let's just take it on from there, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. And we'll hear what he says a bit later on. How much does being a Christian depend on where you were born in the world? If you'd been born in Calcutta rather than Christen, would you have been a Hindu? If you'd been born in Morocco rather than Moody'sburn, would you have been a Muslim? If you'd been born in South Korea rather than Scotland, would you have been a Buddhist? How much does becoming a Christian depend on where you happen to be in the world? Now, if we happen to be in Cairo rather than Glasgow this evening, our meeting together would take on a very different complexion. Um, We would probably have a carpet in this uh, meeting house, a carpet which was wall to wall, not just the 20 foot red runner that we had for the wedding yesterday here, but a carpet covering the whole place. If we were in Cairo rather than Glasgow, you'd have probably been asked to leave your shoes and your Doc Martin boots and your stiletto heels out there in the vestibule before you came in have a right scramble at the end of the day trying to get the right pairs together and uh, very certainly you would have been asked to wash your feet before you had come to this service tonight if we had been in Cairo rather than Glasgow tonight then uh, we probably wouldn't have had a chair one chair between the whole lot of us here and you would probably have been spending most of your time down in your hunkers or prostrating yourself flat on the ground And I would have been chanting rather than preaching. There is is a difference between the two. Are we Christians because we happen to be in the west of Scotland rather than we happen to be at the back of Baghdad? Now some people in our parish tonight, if we went round knocking doors in visitation, would actually say just that and because of that would dismiss the universal and unique claims of Christianity. And there are some teachers in colleges and universities teaching what is known as contemporary religion who would teach just that, namely that all religions can be compared and all religions do have their contribution to make to people depending on where they live in the world. Now these Sunday evenings we are considering the story from the book of Acts of the church which turned the world upside down and that church from the beginning believed it had a mission to the world's population based on a message of the world's saviour you know it's very important and let me say this right at the beginning it's very important for us who are Christian believers to be absolutely convinced that this Christian message from the start was intended for the whole wide world. 
So how did the first church begin to turn the world upside down? And the answer is rather a surprising one. It was through a martyr, through the death of Stephen, the first martyr. A few weeks ago, a Protestant pastor in Pakistan was murdered by a Muslim mullah. The first martyr, Stephen, and the latest as far as we have heard, and in between a long, long line of those who have died for the Christian faith. But perhaps the very first martyrdom was the essentially significant one, because it seemed to um, be the spark to lead to the explosion of evangelism um, all over the world. So we're looking at Stephen and his death tonight and I have found two lessons which I want to share with you this evening the first is this in mission God uses individuals who are full of God in mission God uses individuals who are full of God and the second lesson in mission God uses deeds which are full of evil. And we're going to be spending considerably longer on the first lesson, just so you won't get too worried and anxious as the clock moves on. So the first lesson. Now if you're interested in Bible study, and I hope with all my heart that you are, let me point out to you the fascinating way in which Luke in the book of Acts, Luke's the writer of, of the book of Acts, the way that he describes this expansion of the church's mission, I think it's, it's fascinating. He starts in chapter 1 with the words of the risen Christ to his small band of followers before he leaves them and goes back to heaven. He says to them, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Luke takes these words as a kind of pattern. For the remaining chapters of the book of Acts, he describes how the gospel was proclaimed, first of all in Jerusalem, chapters 1 to 6, and then into Judea and all Samaria, chapters 7, 8, and 9. And then how it begins to be taken to the uttermost parts of the earth from chapter 10 and following eventually, presumably, arrives even at the outer Hebrides and to such outlandish posts of the empire as Harris. But it all begins where we are studying tonight in the Acts with an individual. Indeed, the expansion in the chapters that follow concerns four individuals. Chapter 7, Stephen. Chapter 8, Philip. Chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus. Chapter 10, Cornelius. And then, of course, after that, Luke takes up the story of his great hero, the Apostle Paul, and the rest of the Acts is largely the story of that individual. So what does this pattern suggest to us? Well, surely it suggests to us that God, in turning the world upside down, is pleased to use individuals. And that, of course, has been the story of the church down 20 centuries in the story of Christian mission, we, we learn of great missionaries who were used by God to do tremendous things in various continents and countries. And if I was to ask you for the names of some great missionaries, some of you would immediately come up and tell me, David Livingston, Hudson Taylor, William Carey, C.T. Stern, great individuals. But the practical point which interests me from this pattern of Luke is something much more relevant to our gathering here this evening. For how is it that God is going to turn the part of the world, the area of the world that we live in, upside down? How is he going to do it? Well, we've learned over these last weeks. He does it through the vitality of a Christian community and church and congregation. But alongside that, surely, we learn from here that God is going to use his intention, his plan, his purpose, is to use individuals. Now, you see, it's all too easy for us as individual believers to say 
Well, I'm no good. I'm too weak. I'm too small. I'm too unimportant. It's easy to say that. But let me say for the umpteenth time that God's plan is to use individual believers to pass on his message to engage in worldwide mission. Now I think that's very important for those who are visitors in the stewardship campaign which begins really today to grasp and to take hold of. God's plan is to use individual people to pass on his message and to make his name known. Mind you, it's um, very particular kinds of individuals if we take Stephen as a model. For I think we see here very clearly that uh, Stephen, when he's described, is described as somebody who has fullness of life. It's this fullness that I want to emphasize for quite a few minutes as we look at the description given to him. The fullness of Stephen. If I was coming out of the kitchen at the end of this evening carrying a kettle full of tea, that takes some imagination to imagine me doing that here, I guess, But if somebody nudged my arm, what would spill over? What would overflow? Well, obviously, that which was in the kettle, namely tea. So what was it that would spill over and overflow from Stephen if people came into contact with him? Well, it says here that Stephen was full in himself, not full of himself. We do know people who are full of themselves. And if you nudge them or nark them, well, what comes out? Well, what's inside? Themselves. So nudge Stephen, and what would come out? That which was within, within, namely, the life of God. We have two pairings of description concerning Stephen in chapter 6. And both descriptive couplets emphasize the fullness of his spiritual life. Look at chapter 6 and verse 5. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's, it's this fullness which is emphasized, this copiousness, this uh, plenitude. And it's a very balanced statement here, isn't it? There's God's side, full of the Holy Spirit. There's the human side, full of faith. So what is characteristic of a person who's full of the Holy Spirit? Now, there are various answers that are given to that question today, and I have to say that some of the answers are quite bizarre. But what's the answer that's given here? What is the description of this man who was full of the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, he was full of faith. That's to say he was full of the kind of faith that trusted God in the dark. And so enabled him to keep calm in a crisis. It was a kind of faith in which... He believed God's written down, black and white, easily quoted scripture promises. And so he knew his Bible and he was a wise Bible student, as verse 10 indicates. He was full of the kind of faith that waited for God's guidance rather than rushing in impetuously to some activity like a a headless chicken who was felt led to do something. Stephen was full of that kind of faith which he believed God, depended God, trusted God, relied upon God. In his reactions to life's events, he was faithful, full of faith. And that's what it means here (coughs) to be full of the Holy Spirit. There's the first description of Stephen. The second one is given in verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace, and power. There's the fullness again. Full of God's grace and power. The power relating to the evident anointing of God upon his ministry and the influence that he had from his teaching and preaching and the success of souls saved and the 100% cures and amazing answers to prayer that Stephen must have known. He was full of power, but notice the balance again. This uh, apparently upfront superstar was 
also full of grace. That's to say his teaching and his speaking was characterized by grace, graciousness and gentleness. He was the kind of person who'd be interested in people and concerned to get alongside people and to listen to them and to speak gently and patiently and lovingly with them. It's a marvelous balanced description, isn't it? Full of power and grace. So here is this man who's characterized by fullness. This uh, overflowingness this full and running overness. That's what we are struck with when we, we look at this man. He was full of God. Full of Godliness. He was full of Christ. Full of Christ likeness. Full of Jesus. That's the characteristic thing about Stephen, just full of Jesus in his being, in his person, in his relationships, in his actions, in his reactions, in his interactions, just full of Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of people that God wants to use for worldwide mission he was full of God in his living but notice also he was full of God in his dying and, and that's perhaps the harder thing well it's the road we've not yet traveled is it we don't know what we will be like on our deathbed I obviously see a lot of people well over the years in, in that position and believe you me there's a lot of differences in the way that people cope with the end of life None of us know what we're going to be like in our deathbed, and I only hope and pray that I'll be like many of the godly and Christ-like people that I've seen in my last months and last days. Now, Stephen was Christ-like in his dying. Did you notice that in the second reading at the end of chapter 8? He focuses upon Jesus at the end of chapter 7. He focuses upon Jesus verse 56 look I see heaven opened and the son of man standing at the right hand of God Jesus was in full view for him and he follows it up with two prayers verse 59 and 60 which are carbon copies really of Christ's prayers right at the end at Calvary Lord Jesus receive my spirit Lord do not hold this sin against them so Stephen was full of God, full of Jesus in his living and his dying. And of course, such an individual is bound to make an impact. I don't care where this person is. This person is bound to make some kind of difference to people's lives, wherever that person is, whether that person is in the office or in the community center, or the shopping center, or in the kitchen, or, or in the neighborhood visiting a friend, or somebody in need. Such a person who's full of Jesus Christ is bound to make some kind of impact upon somebody else. Bound to. And you see, witnessing essentially is just being Jesus in the various situations of life where we find ourselves. Witnessing is being Christ. That's what Jesus meant when he said, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Just your very presence there as a believer who's full of Christ, just being there is going to make a difference, going to make an impact, going to make people think, it's going to draw people to ask questions. Witnessing is being a certain kind of person, but it doesn't stop, stop there. It's not just being Jesus, but also speaking for Jesus. And Stephen is a model here for us as well, because it's not just who he was, but what he said that is significant for us. And it's what he said that is noted in verses 10, 
11, 13 and 14. And it's what he said that got him charged before the Jewish court. And there were two main charges. First, that he was speaking against the temple of God. And secondly, that he was speaking against the law of God. And in chapter 7, we find out how he defended himself against these charges. Well, actually, he doesn't really get defense. And that's an interesting point. When we receive hostile questions from hostile people about our church connection or our Christian faith, we very often go on the defensive, don't we? And try to justify ourselves. I think we should take a leaf out of Stephen's book and, and see how he really doesn't give a defense here, but actually gives a testimony about Jesus. And what does he say? Well, what he says in connection with the charges about speaking against the temple and the law are actually very simple and very basic and very practical. Can I explain them to you? What Stephen said in his defense was that Jesus had now replaced the temple. He'd replaced the temple. The temple which was the locus or the focus of God's presence. And Stephen is really saying in his long speech in chapter 7, you know, God has actually never really been tied to buildings. He never has been. He's committed to people. I think if, uh, and it's very interesting, isn't it, that uh, it's the same issue today as it was way back in the beginning often about commitment and tie-ups with buildings. If, if Stephen had been at our congregational meeting in, way back in September, I think he'd had some pretty straight things to say. It's maybe just as well he wasn't there. We might have had a few more martyrdoms that night. But what he's saying is, God isn't tied with his presence to a building. He's committed to his people and making himself known with them. And now his presence is in Jesus Christ and it's Jesus who accompanies his people everywhere where they go. I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. It's the presence of the risen Christ that makes a difference. It was that conviction which made these people turn the world upside down as they went here and there and everywhere with the gospel, the presence of Christ. And it's this, I suggest, that's very important for our visitors to hold on to as they go out and knock doors and call upon members of the congregation. The presence of the risen Christ with you at all times. Jesus has replaced the temple. And secondly, Jesus has fulfilled the law. It's not customs that count with God, says Stephen in his long speech. It's not just doing things in the way that we've always done things that counts. And again, we see it's a similar issue today. There's nothing new under the sun. And Stephen is saying, customs are fine, yet they are okay, but they're not the chief criterion now because Jesus has come to fulfill all these customs. It's his word, it's his teaching, it's his truth. That's the main thing Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so it was this teaching which turned the world upside down. As these first missionaries went out, convinced of the risen presence of Christ and convinced of the living word of the Saviour as they passed it on and spread it by testimony that God did things. So here's Stephen. He's full of Jesus in his living and dying as a person. And he's full of Jesus in his speaking and witnessing and teaching. That's the model witness that's before us tonight. And God uses individuals who are full of God, full of Jesus. And I don't have to say, do I tonight, that such individuals are probably thin on the ground in the churches. Throughout our churches tonight, on church notice boards and vestibules, there's pinned up notices all over the place, wanted, wanted, 
individuals who are full of Jesus, full of Jesus' life, and full of Jesus' truth, wanted. So are we prepared to consider this model and ask ourselves if we can be this kind of individual whom God can use to turn Moody's Burn upside down and Muirhead upside down and the parish of Christ upside down. There's the first lesson, and I do assure you that the second one will not take very long. In mission, God uses deeds which are full of evil. Now, the stoning of Stephen was an evil deed. It was illegal. They had no right to carry out the death penalty, and they framed Stephen with uh, false witnesses who committed perjury. What terrible things are done in the name of religion? If we went round the doors of our parish and talking to people about the Christian faith, I'm sure that several times people would say that. What terrible things have been done in the name of religion, and they would quote the Spanish Inquisition, Northern Ireland, the Middle East, and Bosnia, and because of that they would discount our claims about the Christian message. Isn't that the case? And yes, terrible things have been done in the name of religion. The stoning of Stephen, the murder of this Protestant pastor in Pakistan, the killing of 12 Christians in a Coptic church on the 12th of February in Egypt, the killing of a Kurdish Christian some time ago in northern Iraq in a book room. Why? Because 15 months earlier he professed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Terrible things. This was an evil deed. But the great thing is how Luke shows us that God in his sovereignty uses this evil deed to promote world mission. What happened after this? Look at chapter 8 and verse 1. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And what did they do when they were scattered? Verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And so God used the scattering of these disciples for the preaching of his word. That's what God does in his sovereignty. And there's something else which happened and something much more dramatic. Look back to verse 58 at the end of uh, chapter 7. Stephen was being stoned to death and meanwhile the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. In many respects, this is one of the most dramatic verses in the whole of the book of the Acts. I think I told some of you when I was young, I used to get the Eagle comic. And uh, PC 49, Dan Dare, Luck of the Legion. Any of you remember these great heroes of the past? And on the back page of the Eagle, in the first edition, the editor Marcus Morris started a series on Saul of Tarsus, his conversion and his life. And I still today vividly remember the pictures of the stoning of Stephen. And imprinted upon my memory are the faces of the chief actors in that dreadful event. Stephen's face, his calmness and serenity, Christ-like serenity, the twisted hatred of his murderers and then this young man named Saul at whose feet they laid down the clothes of Stephen a quizzical puzzled perplexed expression on his face and you know it was that day I believe and that moment which turned Saul's world upside down and led him from that day after a lot of searching and seeking to become the one whom God was going to use to turn multitudes and continents upside down in their lives. God in his sovereignty uses something which is evil to do something which is magnificent and wonderful. That's the kind of God we have. 
And you see, we do know that in all things he works together for good with his church, those who love him. And all means all, the good, the bad, and the in-between. And the bad things will not be martyrdom for us, we trust. But the bad things in our lives can be bad enough, can't they? Heartaches, disappointments, troubles, setbacks, tensions, problems. But God, you see, in his sovereignty is able to use all these things. And with his marvelous creative ingenuity, he is enabled in 101 ways to bring good out of such things for the spreading of the gospel, for the advancing of his cause here and there. God uses even deeds which are full of evil to spread his gospel. He can use the troubles which come into our lives for good as he uses us to influence others. So what's this word saying to us tonight? I wonder if God is saying something to those who feel very empty of Jesus in their lives. Oh, perhaps there are people here who are conscious of their lives being filled with all kinds of busyness and activity, filled with all kinds of hopes and ambitions and aspirations. But as I've been describing what the Bible says about Stephen and this fullness, this copiousness of Jesus in his life and in his dying and in his speaking and in his witnessing. You've become aware of the deep emptiness in your life as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. It may be there's somebody here who has never yet known a personal relationship with Jesus and tonight might be the night where God is saying you're empty in your life because you haven't got Jesus in your life yet this would be the opportunity to consider the claim and the call of Christ and the opportunity to open your heart up to Jesus for the first time and to let him in. But you know, I'm thinking perhaps of Christian believers here tonight who, as I've been explaining what the Bible says about Stephen, have been very conscious of an emptiness as far as a real relationship with Jesus is concerned very much aware that whereas perhaps one time in your life he might have occupied that central and primal position, now it isn't the case. Yes, and you're aware of this vacuum and this emptiness and this void inside in you. And perhaps as I've been teaching and preaching, the Holy Spirit has been creating inside you that longing and yearning to have Jesus right in the center of your life again. I wonder if that's the case. If that is the case, let me encourage you tonight to go home and in your bedroom to shut the door and to get down in your knees and to pray to God and to tell him about your need and to express your longings for a returning to that relationship where Jesus filled your horizons, where Christ was special and precious and real and he was at the very center at the very hub of your life and ask him to help you to return to that position and to fill you again with his presence and his power. And I wonder if there are some people here tonight who are scared of dying. And I'm not talking about physical death. What I'm talking about is the pattern that we find in the gospel that you have to die in order to live. If there's to be life around in the parish of Christon, there has to be death, spiritual death, in the lives of Christian believers. That's the New Testament pattern. And we see it vividly tonight. Stephen's death led to life for Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Are you scared then of dying in the sense of giving up these things which you know you shouldn't be holding on to? Dealing with them, disowning them, denying them,
putting them aside, crucifying them, dying that others around us in this parish might live. If you are, let me encourage you again to go home to your bedroom tonight and to speak to God about these things and to ask for his grace to die that others might live. And I wonder if there are some people here tonight whose view of God is too small, who see God as someone who's not really involved in the troubles and the problems and the perplexities of life and find it very difficult to be positive when such troubles swamp you. Is your view of God too small? The Bible tells us of a great and glorious sovereign God who is well able to do everything that he pleases. There is nothing impossible to God, says the scriptures. And he is able to take troubles and setbacks and disappointments and out of it produce something that is lovely and beautiful 